Gracias, uh, Bani and Irene and um, all of you for coming. Uh, this is a pleasure. It's um, fantastic to have all these people. It's been a while that I haven't done a presentation like this with uh, a good amount of audience. And um, it is also the, the right context because this show really kind of like talks to quite a few projects of mine as I will show. Um, I work on several subjects, and as Bani said, <laughs> I've been working for quite a, a, a bit. Uh, but there are a few projects that are really about uh, photography and uh, surveillance, and actually about the face. So it really like fits well uh, this context, I would say. And um, well, I am yeah, really uh, practical, so I am just going to show you projects, not much theory, maybe <laughs> at the end. But uh, I also would start straight to the project that's actually presented in this exhibition, which is Capture, uh, which was done in 2020, so not a um, long time ago. It's actually pretty recent. So um, I was in France, uh, uh, and I was invited to teach in a university close to Paris, in Lille, um, in North uh, France. And part of the contract was to develop a new project, um, something that some happens to artists, of course. And um, I was in a rush, actually, to think about a new project. But I knew enough about France to figure that probably working around uh, uh, police could have been a good idea. I didn't know how far I was going, though. Uh, so I just started to collect photos. Um, some of my work is just like appropriation, uh, just collecting photos. So photos of police. Um, as simple as going to Google and typing uh, police, France, or uh, protest, Paris, uh, just keywords. And um, that process went on for quite a few months, and I started to have quite an amount of uh, pictures. So just to give you an idea, so from having from the internet, of course, when you search on, um, on, on Google, uh, a lot of like pictures are from um, uh, maybe um, just press agencies. Um, some of them are from protests, some others are not protests, but could be, you know, on the stadium, uh, a party, or anything. Um, some others were coming directly from um, newspapers, meaning that are very low res resolution, very small, so they're just like public photos, articles. But then I also start to work with um, some professional photographers, or I would say just the, the activists that go to the protests and they take pictures of what's happening. So it's kind of like informal uh, members of the press, I would say. And I acquired photos directly from them, meaning that I paid them uh, uh, a little fee, and they gave me a bunch of photos, which are actually very high res, and also like very interesting, and uh, you know some of them are very uh, portrayed, perfect pictures. Um, so I ended up to have uh, quite a lot of material, um, uh, 1,000 pictures, uh, 1,000 pictures from protests or police or whatever of the past 10 years in France. So um, the second process was to use uh, facial recognition on these pictures. And so uh, here you see that, of course, in each picture you can have many police officers. And you can also see how powerful can be facial recognition that find faces even when there is just an eye almost, when the, even they are very far away. So the end result of this process was this huge database of only the faces of uh, agents, police agents. And this has resulted to be 4,000 faces because, again, in each picture there are many of those. And so I published everything on this um, website called uh, uh, capturepolice.com. And then I, I just said everyone should try to identify these people. So basically crowdsourcing the identification of these uh, police officers. So here is a very important um, point because facial recognition is not really dangerous by itself because it's just uh, an algorithm that finds the face in a picture like the one that you have on your phone, uh, on your camera, whatsoever. The really dangerous thing is when you connect that biometric data of your face to an actual person, so a name, a surname, eventually a Facebook profile, an uh, address of someone. That's when you really like 
identify someone and it's forever, meaning that then everyone could potentially build their app like I done and go on the street and uh, finding you on the street and knowing exactly who you are, what you like, what you do and so on. So this is really the scary part of the um, project in a way, of the facial recognition in a way. So, but this project works on several levels. So I also done an intervention it's kind of a street art intervention in the city center of Paris where I wanted to expose these pictures even more and just pasting them exactly basically in the locations where also they are present, where these uh, police officers are actually living, but nevertheless bring back these kind of photos, their presence there. And in doing this action, I also done a, a video, so there is also a way to create material that could be used later to document uh, this action and this project. Uh, and nevertheless, also become a kind of interesting uh, kind of street art um, project, if you want. Uh, definitely interesting to see. It was also very interesting to see the people reaction in the street to see that there were uh, police officers right there in, with their faces. And then the other level, which is an installation. Um, uh, this, is, um, this is actually the biggest installation I've done, which is a selection of uh, uh, 150 um, faces, uh, this matrix. Then there are two screens um, that uh, one, um, one show the, um, the project, I present the project, how it works. Another one is more about facial recognition and why it's dangerous and it's more about interviews. But then there are all also like seven prints, uh, final prints that are featured and they are police officers that are shooting straight to uh, the protest in this case, uh, I mean in this case to the audience. So it's quite a powerful installation because you have this wall of police in front of you and seven of them, they are shooting straight and they're not shooting high up, they are shooting straight in your body, which is something that they shouldn't do. It's actually illegal in Europe to shoot at protesters. Uh, this, is, this is like a um, bullet rabbit, uh, sorry, rubber bullets um, that do, don't kill, but they can mutilate you. So in France, many protests lost their eyes or lost their legs. And so there, quite, there is quite a, a bit of police violence in France and brutality, as you probably know. But at the same time, police in France is one of the very few in Europe that does use facial recognition uh, in public spheres, meaning that they are basically doing mass surveillance uh, with this technology. They do have cameras in uh, train stations, in airports, and they use this technology to match uh, potential criminals. They actually have already a database of uh, over 18 million people that have been arrested in, in, um, in France. Uh, but also if they are like, you know, investigating someone from a terrorist or pro protester, they can use facial recognition and find them. We don't actually know what they're actually looking for. But fact is that also it's not really legal to use facial recognition in Europe. It's kind of a great zone of privacy regulation. So they do it just because they feel uh, they can. Uh, but at the same time, you also have them uh, trying to cover themselves and hide, uh, as you can see in some of those pictures, not always, but um, always more, I would say, they are recognizing the fact that it's dangerous to show their face during protest, protests and actually doing violence. So as you can see, here there's not like a, a timeline, but definitely you can see that some faces are completely covered. So you cannot recognize them. So this is like really an asymmetry of power that they talk about the fact that they are allowed to surveil and use facial recognition against citizens. Um, and then they are allowed to use violence against protesters, but meanwhile they are hiding. They are, don't make them recognizable. So in this project, I basically really reshaping this asymmetry of power uh, through technology, and they say, okay, let's try to reverse this and use this technology against you and see what happens. Well, um, this was a provocation uh, that they, um, you know, re reacted very strongly right away. So every now that, uh, every time I launch a new project, I simply send a press release to my contacts, few journalists, and then I just use social media just to say, hey, I have this new project you should look at. And um, here, as soon as I announce it on Twitter, 
um, a first uh, um, union of police in France reacted and replied. So in France there are many uh, unions of police, association, uh, groups that support and uh, surprisingly, I didn't even know, they are very active on social media because they are very influential, they want to be very influential, influential uh, politically with the politicians but also in the media. So they reacted right away and they say this is very scandalous and this is unacceptable, it shouldn't ever happen. And this was like just you know, a few minutes after I published this project. Um, and then another one, uh, just a few hours after, this is another commissioner of the police, another union that said this is very dangerous, um, you know, some police officer could be traced down and uh, they something could happen to them, it shouldn't ever happen. And uh, to the point that just the same day I announced the project, this went well all the way up to the interior minister of France that tweets directly himself that um, this project shouldn't uh, happen, that the website should be taken down, and especially he's also asking that the exhibition, the installation that I shown you, you before, shouldn't be shown. Uh, that, that show was meant to, be meant to open like in a couple of weeks, so it wasn't open yet, but it was um, programmed. Otherwise, it would have been uh, bringing me to court and uh, you know, any kind of legal troubles that you don't want to enter, um, in a conflict with the interior minister on this level, definitely not. Um, so, however, I said, okay, let's stay calm and uh, having cold blood, but the day after, also, uh, the institution that actually helped me to produce this project where I was working on, uh, send another press release, this letter, and says, okay, well, we didn't know anything. Uh, this guy is doing very crazy things. We don't want to work with him. And uh, we are not going to show his work, his installation. And that really was the point when I understood that here I am alone. This is getting very tricky and dangerous because I didn't have the support of any institution in France. And uh, if this, at that point, the website was still on and it stayed on for another couple of days. Uh, until I decided to take down the, the, the website. But I was really surprised when actually they decided to censor the installation. Uh, and this is a, a picture where they're covering that installation I showed you before. Those photos were just before the opening and they are covering them with this board. Which to me is, um, is kind of strange because in, not in many, many projects, you know, I have to take down some material, I, the, the project is done, but for an artist to see your work censored in this way and covered up is really a strange feeling. It's like I have to say, even if I could expect it, uh, it just really was kind of hard. But the police was very happy, so they started to even like make uh, memes about the fact that uh, Thanks God, the, the the work was censored in France and was actually was governmental censorship. Let's not forget that was the minister say to uh, of censoring the, the work. So, you know, they are celebrating uh, what's happening and um, and so on. But this was really the most interesting part of the project to me: is the debate, is the engagement with the uh, audience, like very broad audience beyond the installation. Um, that was happening about the fact, is it a good thing to do this? Is it a wrong thing to do it? Um, and uh, what are the consequences? And this was mainly happening online, and so there are a few videos that have uh, several comments, this is just, I just show you one, uh, that this has, well, more than uh, 150, um, 100,000 uh, views, but especially has more than 1,000 comments and so everyone has, has had something to say about it, some, something to express about their opinion. So this debate to me was most important, and there are many tweets on Facebook and so on. Nevertheless, some of them were addressed directly to me, and so there was also kind of like an interesting kind of reaction that I had to face personally, but definitely um, the, the way this was debated was very interesting. I have done the, all of this because of a campaign, actually, that I launched a uh, few weeks before doing this provocation in France. And the campaign is much larger, and it's a campaign to ban facial recognition in all Europe. 
And it's something I've done also with a petition. And the petition reached uh, 53,000 signatures that are quite a lot. Uh, why? Well, because of doing this provocation with the police, of course, it drew attention to the uh, to the this kind of like uh, campaign, and people signed on, and so there was also quite a bit of engagement that was uh, in this uh, also uh, kind of effort I have done concerning understanding the legal. Um, implications of facial recognition, what was going on in, in Europe especially, because there are a few cases and also collected a, um, a case studies about where facial recognition is used, uh, why it should be banned because not regulated enough uh, in Europe. And so I sent all this package with these documents, this research, the signature to the European Commission, actually to a few um, institutions in Brussels, and one, one, one agency of the European Commission replied and uh, said, okay, yes, you are right, this is a problem in Europe. We, uh, we don't have the, a good regulation about facial recognition and artificial intelligence. We should do something. Thanks us to, thank you to uh, remind us, they acknowledge it. But what is really the problem here is that um, it's not the European Commission able to really make law against facial recognition of Europe, but it's the Parliament of Europe. And the Parliament of Europe is run mainly by first uh, ministers of each country. And the first ministers of each country are obviously very influenced by the interior ministers of each country, meaning the police that say, no, please, we want to keep using facial recognition. And so that's why in Europe until now, even if all we are against it, I mean, if we would have a poll in Europe, probably um, uh, the majority of people would be against it, even, the, even if the European Commission is against it, we still have uh, uh, this unregulated use of facial recognition, mainly because the police has this influential uh, power. So this is uh, um, <coughs> the first project. Let's move to another project. This is uh, from 2016. This is also about the police, but it's actually uh, more, more about the criminals. So here, we are not in France, we are in the uh, United States. United States, you probably heard that is, uh, people really get arrested often. Actually, there is an issue called mass incarceration. Uh, like, in, there is a million arrests every year. They even count more than 100 million of uh, people that have been arrested in the past 20 years. So 100 million, so I don't know, it's like three times Spain <laughs> or something, is a huge amount of people that get arrested. Some of them are real criminals, sometimes not, sometimes just for little things, sometimes it's a mistake. What happened though every time someone gets arrested in the United States? Well, um, some data is collected, and especially the picture is taken, uh, the famous mugshots that you probably saw in TV or in magazine and so on, the famous American uh, mugshots. But these, over the years, started to be quite a bit of data, as I said, one million, uh, um, 100 million in 20 years. And so this is basically a website of a jail, and consider that in the US there are many private jails, there are public jails, uh, it's all like decentralized, so everyone does whatever they want, and sometimes this data is not even accurate. But whatever, you have a picture, a name, a surname, the date of birth, sometimes you know the crime, uh, sometimes you don't. Uh, you have some, some data, but it's not really accurate. It really depends by the police officer you find. What happens is that this is public data in the United States. It's considered governmental data. So it's a little bit because of transparency law, a little bit because they are so, they think that in this way, they, by letting people know about criminals, uh, there is more security. It's just the obsession of security f in the uh, United States. But the consequence is that there are these uh, uh, mugshots website where these pictures get even more exposed and they end up on uh, Google and so on. So basically, if you have been arrested in the United States, maybe you were, going, you were there visiting and um, for nothing, you know, maybe you were driving too fast and so on, and you spent one night, and maybe it was a mistake. 
that picture that was taken that day you were arrested stays online forever and it also multiplies on all websites around the internet. And when someone search your name on Google, the first thing will be this picture. So you can imagine this is dramatic in the United States because a lot of people get arrested and then they cannot find a job, they cannot move on in life because every time they apply to something from college to job, um, that is the first thing and everyone would say, oh, you were a criminal, you were arrested. So what I have done here, and that actually probably was the uh, biggest effort um, and the amount of picture uh, I had uh, was collecting 1,000, oh, sorry, <laughs> with numbers getting harder, one, 10 millions of uh, mugshots, 10 millions of mugshots um, and republished them blurred in this way and we name and surname shuffled. So basically I was cloning this mugshots website and I was blurring the picture as much as I could and mixing up all the names so that when someone was looking for someone, you couldn't find the actual person, basically injecting noise, information noise, uh, like data noise in the search engines. Basically also defending the privacy and the identity of criminals in a way, because in this way it's much harder to find the criminals, right? Um, and so this is like uh, uh, such a huge uh, issue that there are many, many websites that do that and have done on six websites, so I basically cloned and obscured uh, on, uh, on six websites, but there are many more. Um, and then there is these also interesting uh, pictures that are the results, these visual results, and those, those are again 10 millions, a huge amount, and were blurred by an algorithm that was coded by me. So you can imagine this uh, kind of process of this code uh, blurring automatically 10 million pictures uh, of people that have been arrested. And um, because it was a custom made algorithm, some of them, some of those pictures are quite interesting visually, aesthetically. And so I selected very few because how can you like show 10 million pictures? Um, but what I find interesting in these ones is that of course here the identity is blurred, there is a privacy issue you cannot see, but it's also interesting how we judge people and especially how we judge people online from just a picture and not only us but uh, uh, artificial intelligence how it's going to judge these pictures because let not, let's not forget that today all these mug shots are run through facial recognition, um, artificial intelligence that can determine and follow you forever, even much more than just a mugshot site. Uh, so this blurredness is really also just to show kind of like how do we know if this was a serial killer, a very dangerous person, or was just someone that was arrested uh, for a mistake or for uh, racial issues. So here there is quite a few um, ideas behind just one picture. But again, the most interesting part probably was that as soon as I published this project, a lot of people started to write me and telling me the tragic stories that were behind those pictures because yes, it's a mugshot, but again, when happened, why it happened, and uh, also what is tragic about it, once that picture went online, they, their life was really affected uh, even though past like 10 years, even though it was a mistake, they were innocent, and they had to pay money to remove that picture from the internet. And even if they paid a huge amount of money, that picture was reposted again because those people are just trying to make money and doing basically extortion. So I, I tell you I received hundreds of these emails and some of them are really tragic and um, um, poignant. And then I also received a, a legal threat, again, uh, which is from the sites that were actually publishing these pictures and were actually making money, and they sent me this uh, legal letter saying, oh, you are stealing our content, our identity, and our traffic. You are affecting our business. If you don't stop it, we are going to sue you, and you are going to pay, you're going to jail eventually. Um, so there is this reaction, but again, all of this was actually 
uh, to promote a campaign, a privacy campaign uh, that I started, which is also privacy policy that I started to just let people remove uh, the picture online for their rights, basic human rights, which is something in Europe we do have and it's called the right to be forgotten. And funny enough, the right to be forgotten was created by a Spanish guy uh, not long time ago, so probably less than 10 years ago, uh, this uh, Spanish guy, uh, I think from Andalusia, um, he had some trouble uh, with his business and there was information about that old story on Google or internet and he just wanted to delete that information so he uh, sued Google and uh, in Spain and uh, they couldn't be resolved so he went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Europe and the Supreme Court of Europe said, okay, yes, you have the right to remove this old information from the internet. And because of that, that became a law in all Europe that's called the right to be forgotten because of that Spanish guy, that in Europe allow you to remove pictures that you don't want to have online, which means also like, you know, uh, someone that want to treat you or like, you know, for woman is a huge issue and so on. In the uh, US, they don't have this basic right, and that's why it's happening this, and so this became a, a quite a interesting campaign. I started to collaborate with legislators, uh, lawyers, and so on. Um, so far, nothing changed <laughs> again, but definitely is something that I hope is going to change uh, one day. So anyway, um, this is another project, finally someone smiling. Uh, what we are looking now are kind of cops, actually, are kind of police again. Uh, this is uh, the one on your left is um, a director of the NSA. So uh, NSA is like the CIA or FBI. So it's an agency in the United States dedicated to actually surveillance. This was done during the uh, scandal uh, or the revelation of Edward Snowden. And uh, so for months, I was monitoring social media to find uh, pictures of these guys just to see if there was a chance to have unauthorized pictures of directors of those agencies. And actually, I found them. And so as soon as I was finding them, I was uh, transforming them in a kind of like street art. So exposing their face, their smile around the cities um, on quite a big size and through this uh, technique that is a kind of street art technique even to make it even more pop. Um, and so their face just became uh, exposed in this way. This is another guy from the NSA. I've done it uh, on nine um, characters, let's say. Uh, the FBI, CIA, this NSA. This is also kind of interesting because she, this lady uh, meet this guy somehow in a party, we don't know, maybe they were dating. She posts that picture on her own uh, Facebook profile. I take that picture and I make uh, a poster uh, on the streets, but also make kind of like a big kind of painting uh, that ends up in the museums, in the art fairs, in the galleries. So it kind of like become a celebrity. That to me, it says, you know, how these people running these secret programs uh, in the dark, uh, we don't even know them actually because you might know the politicians, big names, but these people are the ones that runs the, the real stuff, uh, just the intelligence community. They live in secrecy, they hide, they have these secret programs, uh, but all of a sudden they become this kind of exposed <laughs> too and they are like becoming like these uh, kind of like pop figures and um, it's also interesting to me that uh, the systems they are trying to control and use to surveil us can actually use to surveil them because these systems are so powerful and so spread that also they fall in this trap in a way. So this is why actually this project is called Overexposed and um, you can see much more my website as anything else. So we are going back in time. This is, uh, this is already 10 years ago, and this is a project I actually have done uh, with Bani in, um, in Barcelona uh, with a kind of big uh, intervention, and uh, was 2013 or something. It's called the Street Ghost. Here it's not only about the face, but it's the entire figure, but actually the face is a big component. 
So here, here the, the operation is very simple. I take a screenshot of a random person I find on Google Street View, and then I print it at the same size, and I paste it at the exact location, the exact spot with the exact size where that picture was taken. So here on one side you have um, the screenshot and the other side you have the paper poster I pasted with glue on the wall. So here I basically do what Google does. Uh, basically I go around the city, I take a picture without asking permission uh, and then I recreate the picture and I paste it at the exact location where the picture was taken. And I've done it all over the world, um, in, uh, in many, many cities at this point. Um, quite a number, it was quite an effort because you really have to go at that location, pasting it, cutting. It's quite a, a little bit of manual work too. Um, and you find any type of situation, like a lady that is a bicycle or like any kind of, you know, whatever is happening on the street and how they are captured. And, um, and also, like uh, in this case, an interesting because an entire family. But here it shows you the point that uh, the faces here are mostly blurred. And they're blurred because the algorithm of, of, of Google tried to protect their privacy. Someone might say, well, but you can recognize them from the closing, you know, how tall they are, where they are, so the faces doesn't help. But especially here you can see that the mom of this family uh, she's completely clear because the, the, the algorithm failed, so it didn't blur, didn't recognize a face and didn't blur her. Um, so these actually show how um, these are kind of like a collateral damage of uh, information war that's happening between, well, the algorithm to try to protect the privacy, Google that wants to have as much information as they want, the legislators that try to regulate all of this but they can't, Eventually, the city, the municipality, they say, well, what's going on here? It's just a car taking picture without asking permission. And so, unfortunately, if you were on the street and uh, the car passed and you were, the picture was taken of you, you are this kind of like, you know, um, casu casualty of this war. And eventually, the artist take that picture and expose you even more eventually. So I am part of that war too. Another interesting part is who owns that picture? Well, I keep the uh, watermark uh, of Google. So just to remark that actually that picture at this point is owned by Google, even if you would say, no, it's my picture, or the city would say, no, it's my picture, or I would say as an artist, it's my picture. Uh, but the other part in interesting of this is the year, and that's actually something that's getting uh, always more interesting because some of them have 10 years, some of them even more at this point, the more the time passed. And especially the car is going around, Google car is going around always more often in these days. Um, and so that also show why these, uh, we are all ghosts, and that's why the project is called Google Ghost, in terms of the fact that to our data, our pictures will eventually come back in this blurred way in, uh, in this um, moment, and we won't have control over that, and that can happen in 100 years from now, 200 years from now. And so we're basically all ghosts from this digital house that we won't have control. And so that's how they are called uh, sweet ghosts, and uh, I show them even when it's about museum show, they always stay, often they stay outside of the museum. So um, let's move on uh, on this project that's less known, but it's really about the face. Um, in this case, it's about Instagram. Um, and so in this case, I was monitoring Instagram to find um, influencers that were promoting um, products they sh that they shouldn't promote, like alcohol, cigarettes, and so on, which is already something legal, but especially without saying that they were promoting it. So basically doing advertising without saying it, which is another illegal thing. So I collected quite a lot. There is even this uh, website where you can eventually report an uh, uh, um, uh, influencer. And then I have done this uh, kind of installation work here where I basically try to uh, decode uh, their visual language uh, 
and some of them are famous celebrity like these, but some others are just people that want to be an influencer or pretend to be an influencer. And to me, this is also very interesting because, well, here we have a very particular uh, photographic language, I would say, uh, but I don't think it's just a photographic language. It's also becoming how we act and we communicate uh, just the way we pose in front of a camera. And here it's not just the camera, it's the algorithm of Instagram, it's the interface of algorithm. And the way we look and so on, it become like part of our common language, visual language that become like how we communicate uh, with each other and we want to appear on the social media but especially on Instagram it's a very specific way to make you look good or eventually you have to look in a certain way to be on Instagram so basically we are fitting this kind of camera and the face again is the main um, uh, tool in a way to um, to show uh, us um, uh, in this way so, okay, let's go back to uh, the beginning. This project has more than 10 years now, and um, I still think this is basically the first project uh, in art that uh, was dealing with uh, facial recognition, but especially with artificial intelligence and especially bias in artificial intelligence, something that's very common in this exhibition and something that's very common by, uh, it's done by many artists now, at least like uh, is getting something that's really relevant and um, everywhere. Back then, I wouldn't even, I couldn't imagine that we could get in this point in these days. It was very hard to uh, f find the tools to do this, but especially it was also just strange to think, oh, this is really going to happen in the future. And uh, it actually did. So in this project was about Facebook, of course, um, and I uh, basically also collected a huge amount of data. Uh, this is an algorithm that I coded that basically was starting from one person, one profile, profile on Facebook, and back then, uh, from one profile, you could find uh, uh, already uh, quite a bit of data. So the main picture, the name, the surname, what they like, where they live, and then also some friends of that profile. So f and uh, for each of those friends, I was doing the same. For, so it was a loop. And that allowed me to collect over a million um, users of Facebook all over the world. So then I used facial recognition first to crop the face as I did with the police, and then to find out which expression they add in the face. Something that back then was very, very hard also just to uh, f technically to do it. Um, and then I updated all this database and f in this database what I've done, I published everything on a dating website that I created for this project. Here it's inter interesting because of course you can see the faces, you can see the names, but especially they're already categorized by um, kind of uh, temperament. So if they're easygoing, funny, mild, smug, and this based on the, um, well, artificial intelligence, assuming that if they have that expression, they must be uh, this way in life. And this was actually working, so you could actually find someone in Barcelona uh, that uh, um, like pizza and uh, eventually is a sly person. Uh, and uh, you could write her because there was the link to the actual uh, Facebook profile. Uh, so here you see the original picture, you see the cropped picture, you see some friends of her, um, and then you also whatever she was liking. So this was a huge provocation, of course, that went viral pretty much right away. So this is just one of the article, this is CNN, but uh, we counted over a thousand um, articles basically in a week all over the world in any kind of language. Um, this generated a huge reaction from the public that started to write and say, oh my God, what's going on? Uh, um, you are crazy, don't do that, remove me. And most of them were like out of fear because they didn't even check if they were inside. They just were scared of being part of it. Some other people instead, they found it interesting, funny, or they were actually using the dating website to try to uh, write uh, to strangers. 
Um, and nevertheless, Facebook also sent a, a legal letter, a disease letter. This was what quite interesting. This project was done also uh, with another Italian artist and so on. And so this, in this letter, they found our private address. So these lawyers were so powerful that they could find us uh, at home, basically. And um, this letter is very aggressive. They say that uh, they will uh, bring us to a uh, tribunal, sue us, and then they ask uh, the data back, the data that was stolen, although they already had the data and it wasn't stolen. Uh, but back then they, they, they thought they were so powerful and they thought to own everything they were having. And then they basically also uh, delete us from Facebook. We had profile on Facebook and they deleted us and they said you shouldn't ever be back. Um, the installation um, is uh, composed by the documentation of what happens, uh, the algorithm, the uh, the, the, the website and this uh, composition, there's a selection again of only 3,000 photos uh, ordered by facial expression. So from the ones that are smiling more to the people that are uh, more serious that were ordered by the facial uh, recognition but artificial intelligence actually. So uh, what happens that we know 10 years later uh, Facebook has been regulated. Facebook went through several scandals. They were actually abusing this data quite a bit. And only recently, uh, uh, actually a couple of months ago in November of last year, uh, they were forced to delete uh, the facial recognition, uh, sorry, the, the biometric data of uh, billions of users because uh, they basically collected not just the picture but that biometric data of the face, uh, the face that's most dangerous things. And so they were forced to delete billions of users' uh, biometric data. So, but this is really what I call the somehow also regulatory art. Um, these issues, these issues are so difficult sometimes that you do need like creativity or even art to kind of like have this edge on technology and especially on legislation. And that's why in these projects, I always try also to talk about legislation. And then another point is this uh, idea of internet photography which is not about um, uh, taking new pictures, but it's actually about placing somehow the camera inside the networks, inside the algorithm, inside, inside the database, and trying to understand how those system works. And I find quite remarkable how photography today um, got this um, this power that's really affecting, influencing uh, culture, uh, economic, uh, legal issues, society, and our personal life as never before. I mean, we had photography about documentary, we have photography about journalism, but if you think how photography is affecting our life and our society today, um, from the internet to the algorithm, uh, qu it's quite remarkable the power of photography that um, uh, we have today. So this is what I could say, and, um, and that's why it's very important, this show and being here, um, talking about photography, but not only. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Paolo. Um, I guess we have time. Oh, lo digo en castellano. Uh, Tenemos tiempo para conversar con Paolo. Uh, Podéis hacerlo incluso en castellano o puedo hacerlo en catalán. Uh, y si cal, uh, faig yo la, la traducción. O oh, si voleu, parleu en inglés directamente. Um, nah, somos muchos y muchas, así que igual si intentamos ser como, ir como un poco a, al, al grano de la cuestión. Uh, aguantaré yo el micrófono por cuestiones de, de una cosa llamada COVID. You can show it in French, as far as I understood. Yes, okay. I think it would be very difficult. Okay. And um, I have some curators in France, they want to show s some projects of mine, but they never choose that one. <laughs> but 
in the rest of Europe, you didn't have any problem. I mean, in well, in Barcelona? other countries, yes, like mm -hmm. here, I didn't have problems. But uh, this, I mean, maybe now there, are, you know, it's better time. Uh, but I remember, uh, like uh, six months after I published the project, but even more, I had a conference like this, but it was even online, and um, it was a very academic, very kind of like close off. Um, conference and someone at the end of the conference like you made a question and that question was really against the project and against me so they were still following me uh, to the point to go to a very academic um, online conference to make their point valid so you know it was kind of like um, people got really moved by the project and they were actually following me and trying to understand they was keeping doing it um, so maybe in a few years I can show it in France, but I don't know when, uh, not soon. Because to be honest, I imagine that you had more problem even outside France, because it's European Communion and because the, with the old stress regarding terrorism and... Yes, and definitely, and definitely. Yeah, in France people are very touched about these issues uh, because of terrorism. Yeah, as well. Sorry? In UK as well. UK as well, yes, yeah. it really depends uh, city by uh, city by city also sometimes, you know, country by country timing. Also, you should consider this happened uh, during the protests uh, of Black Lives Matter, United States. Uh, so it was also the timing was also kind of right. So there was a lot of protests against police brutality. Uh, so people that were pro or against police and then in France, they had Macron, the um, yellow vest protests were just ending, so there was like years of very intense uh, civil unrest. So it was also the right time, so I, I really touched the, the, the right nerve, I would say. But it could change, you know. Um. Well, actually, uh, as far as I know, in Spanish, this project would be illegal because you're not allowed to take pictures of, of uh, cops here. Oh, so well. they've got a gag law, uh, Lei Mordaza, no? Mm -hmm. uh, oh yes, yes, yes. Well, it's always like uh, you know the blurred line between journalism and not. Uh, so if you can demonstrate that you are doing this for journalism and it's going to be published, and also what kind of journalist you are, you are probably fine. But definitely, for instance, in France, when they had to report about this project, they were so worried that they were blurring the pictures of the artwork because they didn't want, so the journalists didn't want to get in trouble even about to show the piece. So it really depends how far, you know, the journalists, but especially the, the outlet, the newspaper, want to go. And, uh, you know, if they have strong lawyers and they are fine, yes. But most journalists, actually, they are worried to get in trouble with the police because also they wouldn't get the information they need to report on other things. So it's kind of like a, a difficult relationship they have. So, but that's why, you know, it's important that artists or like uh, journalists that are not the big ones keep reporting. And in France, and you didn't mention this, but in France also, um, after this project, there was um, a an, an proposal for a new law to uh, forbid the publishing and uh, taking picture, like here in Catalonia. And uh, actually, there were huge protests against it. And um, then they got away with it with a watered down law, security law. which is uh, quite uh, personal, which is not very related to the art, but um, you mentioned in several occasions that you had some kind of legal trouble, but you never actually uh, told the audience how it ended or how you, you could get away with it. Mm -hmm. But this is not what interested me. It's just more, uh, feel, do you feel secure? Um, are you scared sometimes about, uh, yeah, you, you're dealing with, NSA, CIA, FBI, mm -hmm. and those guys are very powerful. <laughs> and uh, and if you're not scared, how in in which amount uh, do you think that it's uh, um, uh, kind of limiting the the scope of your projects in the future? This this threat. Well, limiting, let's say that I know the boundaries, so I think I know the boundaries, so when I receive those legal letters, I usually try to negotiate very quickly, 
And so, okay, say do this, but I don't do that, or I do whatever you want most often. Sometimes I feel I should keep doing it, especially if it's not the interior minister, but maybe it's an entity that is smaller. Um, so they don't, you know, uh, they don't scare me. Uh, definitely what scares me more is, you know, that kind of like personal threat or like the crazy guy, let's say, that can come up and say, oh, I don't like this and so on. But nevertheless, also in that case, I try to be safe and um, anyway is art, so it doesn't really scare that much. There is also kind of an irony in a way. Let's say they did receive uh, some messages that were scary, and um, but it's part of the project, sometimes I also kind of like it. And definitely it's very stressful when I publish one of those and uh, there is that moment of intensity and so on. you never know what can happen. Um, but, you know, as part of the work, my job. <laughs> In fact, there's a long, uh, long tradition, and you're part of this tradition, uh, in my opinion, of uh, something that was called uh, tactical media in the 90s, or even before the, in the 80s, uh, culture jamming. Uh, in other contexts, it was called interventionist art, uh, which means uh, doing something that really deals not with just representation, but with the actual machinery, the social and political machinery, and sometimes even technological machinery of our society. And so when you get into that machine, you're, uh, you're like changing some little piece of this machinery and which provokes some kind of unexpected results. And yeah. th the work is precisely what kind of results and what happens then. Yeah. Well, th to some degree, it's also kind of, um, I, uh, I feel sometimes I am reenacting this kind of performance of the hacker uh, kind of stuff, you know, which is, if you look at like famous hackers or like even Edward Snowden, somehow they, you take that risk, you leak this huge amount of data. So I think also the particular thing of this practice, like the, uh, the data, the sensitive information, the fact that one person in their bedroom can reveal or like uh, distribute this amount of data, that particular uh, sensitive information, and then you get this reaction that is due to the power of that information that has been released. So, and then you have to face the consequence as an individual. And the inter interesting thing is that as an individual, you have such power in a way that wasn't available before, because before you had uh, to have uh, soldiers to fight the government or you know, to fight a big institution. Now one guy in the bedroom can do it, but at the same time cannot really fight back when the institution really is against you, which is really common in any uh, hacker stories that you would find. There is that moment when that person managed to you know, put down the, or like confront the institution quite a bit, but then you have this kind of like power coming back to you as an individual, not as a group of people fighting together. So it's a kind of like interesting dynamics that's really kind of recent and is, is like beside the uh, interventionism uh, in the past, this is like kind of interesting because it really comes to uh, individual person, especially the power of a particular kind of information that that person reveal. So um, that's really like uh, unique, I would say, historically. In the in the, the earlier projects, you use you use technology, but you didn't use it against those that implemented against Google. You used it for a different purpose. But in the latest projects, it seemed to me, and, and I didn't know your work, um, you used it really against against power, or against the police, or against those mm -hmm. that use it. Is there an evolution in, in your work in that in that regard? Uh, yes, there is an evolution which is also following a little bit what is the evolution of the internet and how we are affected or we behave on the internet. So for instance, I don't know if I would do the projects uh, on Facebook the way I've done it back then because 
is also kind of a little bit abusive uh, against the users in a way, although we are all complicit in this and somehow do have also to kind of like not educate but provoke the users, not only the power structures. Uh, but back then, I mean, you know, people are just like, uh, they were mindless uh, publishing everything. Uh, we wouldn't imagine even that that could have been uh, that dangerous. It was kind of like a moment, a momentum where everything was allowed. And actually probably that's why I've done it because I said this is like incredible, the amount of pictures I can collect and I can do these things. And uh, having uh, an artwork with uh, millions of people involved, I am just going to do it, I don't care. Um, so that, you know, is something you cannot do it today because we culturally, it's not a legal issue even, it's just culturally, we are not just going to take the picture of your friend and post it on a dating website. Um, you know, you don't do that because it's rude, right? But back then, probably you have done it because it was kind of like still, okay, why not? So I think also culturally we are evolving and learning more about how to use this medium. And, uh, and I learn it too, you know? Uh, so I am just trying to follow these paths and sometimes I try to be a little bit ahead uh, or like to say, this is going to be an issue. And in fact, you know, the project with Facebook, yes, it was rude if you want, but it actually was showing how rude it could actually get, something that actually then it became. I actually have a... I, oh. Well, um, I'm seeing that your, your projects um, do generate some kind of changes, okay, and action. And out of curiosity, have you ever engaged with uh, someone in your project? I mean, has someone where contacted you and said, hey, I am this guy and you have changed my life in some way? Uh, well, with the Mac shots site, a lot. Um, I mean, quite a few people wrote me. Um, there were other projects, yes, but that one definitely some, they really got involved and they explained me everything and uh, yes. Changing their life, no, because I couldn't really resolve the issue, but we started to collaborate and, um, and I was trying to help them as much as they could, definitely. Um, otherwise, uh, some project didn't really generate any reaction. For instance, the one of Google Street View, um, there wasn't anyone complaining, strange enough. Um, I don't know exactly why, probably because there was nothing to do because that picture was already on Google Street Map. But it did happen and some people told me, this is me, please make a poster of me and make me uh, an artwork. <laughs> So, you know, sometimes people get just excited and they want to be <laughs> featured in the art. So that can also happen, of course. I actually have a comment. I, was, uh, I am fascinated by the fact that photography and, and imaging, actually, photography probably is not the right term anymore, but imaging is something that goes beyond uh, personal human expression. Uh, of course, that's our perspective because we like to see people in images, to recognize people in images, people we like and ourselves in pictures. But there are so many other ways that pictures work in, in contemporary world. And in other projects you work um, not just on, on um, face recognition, but uh, biometric recognition like body scan, uh, thermal camera, or even thermal camera to use to recognize uh, emotions. Because when you uh, feel some kind of emotions, uh, um, probably your body is behaving in a different way, not just your face, you know? And, uh, and there are systems to detect that, to take up pictures, quote unquote, of your emotion through your face, but also maybe through your body temperature or through, through your uh, heartbeat, I don't know. And that's also imaging. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's interesting because it opens, opens up a whole new uh, field of intervention, of aesthetic, uh, cultural, and even political or techno-political intervention. Yes, well, now I definitely focus on projects uh, with facial recognition where the face was the main uh, feature. 
uh, but it's true now I am also more interested in this biometric technology that's much broader and uh, definitely surveillance uh, as we learn about it through the internet and social media now is moving to our face and what's happening is moving to our entire body and so these body scans are indeed uh, uh, um, allowed, I mean they're able to scan our internal organs and of course each of us has very particular organs uh, some of us have some particular diseases, some of us has particular emotions that they express through the body. And this is quite scary, especially in terms of like discrimination, because one thing is uh, surveillance, so I can identify you the way you are high and so on, the shape of your body. But another thing is say, okay, I know that you have this weakness. Um, and so based on that, you cannot access this thing, or you cannot do this thing, or I know how old are you or whatever. And so that's kind of scary. And there is really little you can do because you cannot really just cover your face because these body scans are thermal, as you said, but there are also technologies that are even more invasive. They can really uh, scan your body also from far away, behind walls and uh, so on. And yes, just imagine how many details we have in our body, like uh, from uh, organs to uh, um, outside skins and so on. There is so much to uh, identify. And, um, and yes, and then you can relate it to other things. So when you start to match it with your face or even uh, the way you think, because never, let's not forget that until now, the machines are not able to read our thinking, but one day, that's really the breaking point, I would say, you know, when they start to actually read a little bit our mind or connect all these points and be able to read your mind that's actually about the emotions, but actually about your thoughts. That's kind of like a little bit scary, and that's why legislation is so important that you like uh, forbid that kind of development before it gets too late. So because these, these techniques are not infallible, as we've seen in your, uh, one of the last projects that you've shown, like Lovely Faces uh, uh, website, you could see the labels of the people, and you mentioned some, and those labels come from uh, data, well, annotations of data sets that actually label images. And that's completely uh, arbitrary, because someone at some point said that face corresponds to that emotion or to that social role, and so all these mechanisms to uh, decipher your emotions or your thoughts uh, are not scary because they, they can really x-ray you and discover what you think. Is that because they think they know what you think based on some kind of assumptions that someone took at, in advance. And so there's another layer of of fear <laughs> related to Yeah, that. well, I don't know what is worse <laughs> between the two, <laughs> if they are very accurate or they are not, it's yeah. anyway. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really controversial when someone says, oh, some, actually some companies and some institutions say, we should amend our data sets in order to mm -hmm. be really diverse and to recognize, for instance, you know, uh, black Afro-American faces. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, is that a good thing, really? Is that a good <laughs> thing? <it's> <laughs> Yeah, that's also one of the points, yes. ¿Cómo vamos con los tiempos? Ah, perfecto. Vamos bien, ¿no? Bueno, mientras haya pregunta, vamos bien. Uh, do you take any special measures when using the internet? Like, for example, do you use Google products? Do you have your own private email? Uh, VPN, different kind of things or tools, and if so, explain why you do what you do. Um, yes, a little bit. I try not for everything. Um, I think it's very hard and difficult these days to hide. And nevertheless, the other problem, that's my problem, is that if I hide too much, then I feel that someone might get worried that they don't know what I am doing. So basically, I kind of like say, okay, it's fine if they know what I'm doing so they don't get worried and, you know, so sometimes I accept the fact that they might be surveilled because, you know, when you work, you do a project for one year against the French police, you know, maybe they heard something, let's say. 
Um, but again, what makes me more worried is like this, this, the crazy guy that instead wants to know what I am doing and follows me. And so that is something you can try to avoid. And uh, so that's why, yes, I have private emails. I use VPN sometime and uh, so on. But beside that, I cannot do anything, you know, against the big guys. So, and uh, also sometimes, you know, to be productive and fight them, you have to use the same tools. So that's why, you know, maybe I have to use Google, maybe I have to use uh, some products that I don't like, but make me more productive. Um, so yes and not, I would say. Creo que tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más. Si alguien se anima, o algún comentario también. Maybe Pedro has a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so he was saying time is up. Right? Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get right. Sí, bueno, okay. pues entonces, eh, muchísimas gracias, Paulo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you.